Welcome to part two of things that can eat up time while shooting on a set. If you don't see something here, go back to my other videos and look for part one and you'll find six more things that can also really screw up your schedule. Exterior locations. I'm going to warn you right now, a lot of exterior locations are going to have their own set of problems. For example, if you're shooting on a boat or in, near the seaside, you're going to be dealing with screaming seagulls, waves crashing, maybe kids yelling in the background, lifeguard whistles, you name it. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that you might be dealing with for that particular type of location. If you're shooting in the middle of the woods, you've got all kinds of crickets to deal with as well. So, we're going to be covering mostly the most common problems when it comes to exterior shooting. The biggest one by far is going to be shadows. Now, I had a cameraman once tell me that God was his gaffer, and when it comes to exterior shoot, nothing could be closer to the truth. When you're shooting interior, you have a lot more control over the environment and where the shadows are cast. But exterior, you might have everything bouncing just right, and then a bird flies overhead, and there's your shadow again. Or a leaf moves, or a branch moves, or the wind blows. Shadows are going to be a big problem for you when it comes to exterior shooting during the day and even at night because they're going to be cast by the lights that you're using. So expect to spend at least twice as much time lighting an exterior scene than an interior. And the other biggest problem when it comes to exterior shoots is the local wildlife. And I don't necessarily mean just bears and raccoons, I also mean insects lots and lots of insects. If you're shooting in the tropics, you're probably going to be dealing with a whole army of mosquitoes. If you're shooting up north, you have other types of insects, particularly spiders, to deal with. Insects are going to be a problem no matter where you're shooting outside. The other problem is temperature. You do not have any control over how hot or how cold the location is going to be, and this has all kinds of problems as well. If you're shooting a beach scene in December, you might have some very, very chilly actors. If you're shooting an army scene in the middle of June, you might have some sweaty militants. So keep in mind your wardrobe choices when it comes to time of year that you're shooting exterior. Exterior shooting at night. If there's anything that will make an exterior shoot take even longer, it's by shooting it after the sun goes down. The biggest problem with exterior shooting at night has to do with lighting it. You're going to be spending an awful lot of time trying to get those lights just right in order to light up the actors without making it look like it might as well be daylight outside. But there are other little problems that come out as well. Nocturnal wildlife comes readily to mind here. I've been on several sets where raccoons have taken off with personal belongings and when there wasn't anyone around to watch them. So you're going to want to have any of your actors secure any of their belongings, and I mean really secure, as in put them in their car and give their keys to a PA. If you're shooting exterior at night, particularly in a wilderness setting. The other problem is figuring out how to light your scenes without the additional noise of things like generators. A lot of people will use battery-powered lights for this, which is great, but you're going to run out of batteries eventually, and then you're stuck in the dark again. If you are using a generator, you will be keeping that thing far, far away, and that can run into a problem as well as it's running out of gas left and right. There are a lot of problems when it comes to coming up with the lighting for an exterior night scene. My suggestion is try to keep it on nights where there is some moonlight out there. Otherwise, you could end up pitch black in the middle of the woods, and that is never a good idea. Large casts. By large casts, I mean casts that are over four or five people in a scene, or scenes that require a lot of extras, even if they're background extras doing something just to fill out the scene and make it look more natural. Now, the more people you add to a production, the longer things are going to take to get into order. It's human nature for people to want to talk, especially first thing in the morning. When they're first getting up, they might talk about what they watched on television the night before. They might talk about some funny story that happened while they were brushing their teeth. Whatever. Normally, you will schedule some time for people to get some breakfast, do their little green room chatter as they're getting ready for their scenes. However, if the stories are particularly funny, they could end up spending much more time offset than when they should be on it. Now, when it comes to extras, chances are really good that these are people who have almost no, if any, acting experience, which means you're going to have to be teaching them how to be actors. 
really quickly. Most of them are going to want to look at the camera. Some of them are going to try to do something to make themselves stand out because, of course, this is how you're going to recognize that they're the next big star. The extras can be unpredictable. Now, there are a lot of actors who will work as professional extras, but those are paid gigs. If you're dealing with a low-budget independent shoot, chances are you just basically put out a call saying, hey, I need people to be in this movie, meet me here, you'll get some food, and you're going to end up with all kinds of people who are going to be thrilled and tickled pink that they're going to be in a movie, and you're going to be dealing with a lot of people looking at cameras, waving their arms around, overacting, trying to do something to stand out in the background, and that's really going to distract from your main characters, and it's going to make your life miserable and you'll be calling cut an awful lot and if you're really lucky they might get the hint after about the third time. If you have one that's being a little bit too crazy, just get rid of them. Stunts. Now, I need to make it clear right now, stunts is defined as being anything other than walking and sitting. So if you have people who are running, dancing, skipping, playing, riding horses, whatever, those are also considered stunts. It's not just diving out of airplanes and running in front of cars. Stunts take a notoriously long time to do. The more complicated the stunt, the more time it's going to take. It is not unheard of for a big stunt to take two or three days of shooting to get right. For low-budget films, they try to get it done all in one day. Sometimes several in one day, which is never a good idea to begin with. You're going to want to take time when it comes to shooting stunts. Make sure that whoever is coordinating your stunts talks to your cameraman and talks to you to let you know exactly what the steps are in order to make this work. Keep in mind, things can go wrong. Expect a stunt to have to be done more than once, especially fights. Fights are notorious time eaters. Do not be surprised if you end up having to shoot the same punch three or four times just to get it right. And of course, the more people you add to a stunt, the more time it's going to take. This holds especially true when it comes to dance numbers, prom scenes, synchronized swimming, swim meets, sports events, anything that requires more than two people in order to perform the stunts. Just expect to spend at least a day or two with these scenes. Don't even try to rush it, otherwise you're going to be really, really upset when you see the dailies and you don't have time to reshoot. So, do yourself a favor, if you've got multiple person stunts, schedule multiple days. Cars and other vehicles. This can be anything by way of other vehicles. It doesn't matter if it's a skateboard, a scooter, a boat, or a semi-truck. When you're filming moving vehicles, this is going to be a time eater. You not only have to coordinate with the drivers, but you also have to make sure that you've got your camera's angles right and your camera focus right. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a lot of blurry, out-of-focus vehicles as they zip by. It'll be a mess. So... Take your time with it, expect to do several takes, expect to take sef several angles. If you're shooting a big car chase scene, you're probably going to be spending more than a day on that shoot. Even parked cars can be a problem, especially if they happen to be parked right in the way of the perfect shot. This happens more frequently than you can imagine, because a lot of the times, especially when you're dealing with exterior locations that you don't have complete control of, you're going to end up moving your camera around. If you're shooting on a street, you might not necessarily have control over the cars that are parked on the side of the road. So you might have to move your camera, or if you're lucky, you'll be able to know who the car owner is and have them move their car for you and get it out of your shot. Special effects. Trust me, I could do a 16-hour video on how much fun special effects can do to a schedule. But for the time being, we're going to talk about both practical effects and visual effects. Lately more people have been turning more towards VFX, which are the visual effects. That is usually putting somebody in front of a green screen and then digitally putting the image in later. Now while this might go a little bit faster on a set once you have everything set up, your time eating could be have more to do with your actors. And that is actors who are trying to play against something that they can't actually see or, in many cases, they'll be trying to act against a tennis ball on a string or something to give them an eyeline visual. It's still difficult for them to figure out how big the creature is that they're fighting against, where they're supposed to be looking, how to react to it, and it can be very difficult to look terrified of a tennis ball on a string. So, expect to be doing several takes when it comes to this type of acting. 
Now, practical effects, also known as in-cam effects, is going to take even longer. If you are working with somebody who is familiar with these types of effects, talk to them, find out from them how much time they're going to need in order to execute an effect, and schedule a little extra time for any type of emergencies, especially if it's something like blood splatter, because you could very well have to stop everything, clean everything back up, and then reshoot it. So schedule in a little extra time if you're dealing with a professional. Now, if you're doing these types of effects yourself, figure out how much time you think you're going to have, and schedule yourself at least three times as much because no matter what you imagine it's going to be like, there are a lot of things that can go wrong, and if you're new at effects, chances are that every single one of those things is going to go wrong. That's going to eat an awful lot into your schedule. Unless it's something very simple, like you know, maybe just a quick stabbing effect or something, you might be able to get away with getting it done within an hour or two. But if you have a lot of effects going on, or big fights, or a combination of both, as often as the case, dedicate a full day to these. And if you're really lucky, you will actually be able to stay on schedule. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of The Unconnected Filmmaker, and if you found this information useful and want to be notified when the next video premieres, just hit that subscribe button. Or, if you have anything you'd like to see an episode on, feel free to comment below. See you next time, and keep those cameras rolling.